Well, aloha, y'all. I just came back from Houston, Texas, so I had to throw in a y'all in there. So here we are, Wednesday again already. It was only a short week ago that I was talking to you from my dining room in Houston, Texas, through the magic of Think Tech Hawaii and their technical staff. So today we're here with Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This is sponsored by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum with funding from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So very pleased to have a full court press here. You're going to do this, guys? No? Yeah, okay, ready? Okay, ready, set, go. Ready, okay. Speak no evil. <laughs> See no, no evil. evil. Speak no evil. Hear no evil. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, there we go. <laughs> no evil. So we don't do evil. So I have my <laughs> no co-host here, Jay Fidel. Hi, Jay. And we Hi, have, Mitch. Welcome back. Thank you, y'all. Y'all. <laughs> we have Peter Rossig from the Hawaii, um, from uh, Hawaii. Yeah, the big utility. Pico, yeah. Well, Hawaiian big, Electric Company. Hawaiian Electric Company. He's, he's going to talk to us about uh, their latest uh, electric vehicle fast charger station. Right. That's it. And then also pleased to have Michael Cooney from uh, HNEI, who's a chemical engineer with uh, you know, expertise in biotechnology. And he's going to talk to us about climate change and what we can do about it. So I'm going to start off with, I give the floor to Peter. He's going to tell us about the latest uh, and greatest from Hawaiian Electric. Oh, absolutely. So a couple of weeks ago now, we uh, opened our 10th electric vehicle fast charger on Oahu, 17th across our, our service territory that's owned and operated by uh, the Hawaiian Electric companies. And it's in Haleiwa, Haleiwa Town, right. you know, that shopping center uh, that's, uh, you know, got a lot of nice stores, restaurant, and, and uh, a place where my wife goes to spend money uh, uh, on clothing <laughs> and the stuff. Moving, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, it, the, the important thing is, uh, first of all, it's another DC fast charger for people who are, uh, who are transiting that area, obviously. But the nearest one uh, going in one direction is uh, back in the uh, Valley of the Temples area, Kola Shopping Center. Right. And then going the other direction, the nearest one is at the Dole Plantation. So uh, those are far enough apart that I think uh, some people might be worried about that distance. Most people don't drive, as you know, that far. But if you're a visitor or if you live uh, out there and you've commuted to town and so forth, um, I think it'll be assuring to, reassuring to people to know that there is a, a DC fast charger there. Uh, customarily, it'll, uh, you know, in about 15 minutes, it will give you about 43 miles of charge. Right. And um, there is a, speaking of charge, you have to pay for it, but it's a, a reasonable rate and it, it, is, uh, it operates in with our time of use rate. So right. uh, best if you can do it, uh, uh, not in the middle of the day, not during our peak 5 to 9 p.m. Uh, and this is uh, part of our continuing effort to get, uh, especially get to strategic locations where either because they're remote or because there are a lot of uh, high rises in the area where we think uh, people will welcome it. In town, uh, as you know, we have a couple at Ward and we have some out by Costco in Ivale and uh, going out in the other direction toward Hawaii Kai. But especially the ones in town are good for a lot of the people in Kaka'ako who may be living in high rises, not have charging capacity sure. in their building. Yeah. You know, most people, of course, charge at home, and that's fine if you've got a single family residence where you can have a charger in the garage. So we're trying to put them in strategic locations. And it's part of a continuing effort to uh, get the state to electrify transportation. We're not just talking about cars, of course. We're talking about buses. We're talking about the cranes at the ports. Um, we're talking about a lot of different aspects where today we use fossil fuels, which we're going to hear about yep. a good deal about in a moment, uh, and get it on electricity. Um, because increasingly, of course, we're using more and more renewable energy to create electricity. Uh, and as we do that, we will get further and further off, uh, off of fossil fuels, uh, both for transportation and for electricity. But even if you think of your vehicle as being charged entirely by the fossil fuel component, you're doing less in the way of, of, uh, of climate change damage, I believe, if you, do it if you use electricity uh, generated even by oil. But 30% roughly of our, of our electricity today is generated from renewable sources. So uh, as that number continues to go up, more and more of what you put in your car will be electricity from renewable sources. 
So you referred to DC. How is yeah. that, I mean, DC fast charging, how is yeah. that different from what I have in, uh, you have in your house? Sure. Uh, in, in your home, you have, you, you basically, you go off alternating current. Uh, it's the same stuff that's coming out of the plug where your toaster right. is or whatever. Uh, and that, um, I guess, to be very technical about it, you could say that moves more slowly than, than uh, the uh, direct current, which is what... Uh, we're able to pump into the car from uh, these DC fast chargers. So that's why you're able to put more uh, electricity into the car more quickly right. than at home. Uh, a typical home charger, if you were what we call level two, it might take you, uh, you know, six hours or so overnight to charge uh, right. to replenish your car. Uh, and if you're just using trickle or what we call level one, just plugging it into a standard plug, it could take eight to 10 hours, which is not a big deal if you get home at six in the evening and uh, go out the next day at six in the morning, trickle is all you need. And most people will uh, continue to charge mostly at home. But if you're out on the road and you're worried, you're looking at that little meter on your, on your car and it's getting, getting lower range and lower, you're getting range up, yeah. anxiety, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's good to know that without a, 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 not a great deal of distance, and there are a lot of other level two chargers out there, but if uh, in a lot of supermarkets or, or uh, shopping centers or so forth. But very often for those, there's a line because it takes an hour, people, you know, take an hour or two to, to charge up. So a fast charger is fast and you can get enough to get home to your, you know, your, your dearly beloved home charger uh, in a relatively small number of minutes. And you know, we know that it's not going to be heavily used. The ones in town, the ones at Ward, for example, are very heavily used. Yeah. Sometimes there's even a line, uh, not too long a line, but there at Evil A, we see people who have to wait 10 or 15 minutes. But out at Halib, I think most people will not find a line, but they, so they know they can always get a charge. It's like yeah. knowing that AAA is driving along right behind you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when you run out of gas, they're going to fill you up and move you on. You it's just that kind of assurance. And uh, we've, we've found that that's important to people. So uh, that's our, our mission, is to get those fast chargers out where they can do the most good. As part of our overall uh, support for electrification transportation. Okay, great. This means I have two questions. Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, if I kept talking, can I get a done no, no, one? No, no, no. Okay, well, you may, maybe you answered it, you know, inherently anyway, but it sounds like Wine Electric is building out a system which is going to, you know, deal with range anxiety and sort of connect the dots around Oahu anyway. Right. Um, and you keep, on, you keep on adding these charging stations all over the place. Um, but, you know, query two things. Um, you know, am I, am I, if I can, if I only have, say, a hundred mile range on my car, say it's a, an older one, yeah. okay, am I always going to be assured that there's one within my range? Maybe my effective range is even less than that. Um, is there going to be another one close enough so that I can sort of hopscotch around the island and never worry about not finding? And I'm, I don't mean only your stations, I mean all the stations. And the, shopping centers, wherever they are, gas stations, wherever they are. Um, is it, are we up to that point now? I think we are at or very near the point that uh, even the first generation of electric vehicles, those Leafs that are out there, they were getting 80 or 90 miles. Uh, even when they first arrived and we did uh, testing, we had people who were able to drive from the convention center out to the North Shore and back without a recharge. But that last 20 or 30 minutes getting back to the convention center was kind of, uh, you know, what happened? The air conditioning isn't working here. I'm sweating. I'm sweating getting back to the, uh, to the place where the charger is. And that's just not comfortable. So uh, I think right now you could tr travel all around Oahu with the assurance that either one of our fast chargers or one of these uh, level two chargers is always in access. And you can find out where exactly they are with an app. Uh, on, on our Hawaiian Electric app, I'll show you. That was my second well, question. Well, I, yeah, I knew okay. that. So <laughs> with the Hawaiian Electric app, you can, you can find out where the fast chargers are. And with another app, a PlugShare, it's called PlugShare.com, uh, you can uh, find out where the other accessible chargers are. And um, so I think, you know, anybody 
uh, has a, a, an assurance on this island that they can get where they're going. On the big island, uh, we have chargers in Hilo, we have chargers in, in Kona side, we have a charger uh, along the Sadler Road in, uh, right? in, in, in uh, where the H, uh, the H, the grocery store is GTA, whatever, I, yeah, sorry. Okay. Anyway, KTA. KTA, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right, <laughs> uh, where the KTA is. So even on that, you know, heavily traveled course, uh, you're in pretty good shape. If you're going down to South Point, yeah, I think you have to be a little more concerned because we don't really have a fast charger down there. And probably the number of regular chargers are uh, kind of few and far between. Well, but, it's encouraging. I mean, because it sounds to me like there's a plan so that, it, you know, in the X years, no charging station will be further than X miles from yeah. the next one. So I can always hopscotch around the state, any island, uh, and my car will always work. That's, that's, that, that's encouraging. That's yeah. the goal. I mean, that's what you've got right now with, with gas stations, of course. And we have to replicate that for electric vehicles or people will always say, well, I don't quite, I'm not quite sure. So we have to replicate that, that seamless ability to always know you have enough, enough fuel and you can get more fuel if you need it. Assuming this is not classified information, when, where's the next one going in and when? Uh, well, I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> mainly, mainly because I don't know. We've got, we've got, we always have two or three in the works. And, you know, it, it, it is, uh, we're negotiating with landowners and then getting the permission. Okay, These okay. things are not, you know, casually, quickly done, no, unfortunately. No, 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 no. So, uh, you know, we've got several in the works, and I don't want to say this one is next when it turns out to okay. be that one. But, you know, I'll come back. Here to uh, think tech when we do the next one, you know okay. that. Uh, let me let me, uh, let me leave the floor to somebody who has something even more important than mine. I'm still glad I asked. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for that Absolutely. update, Peter. And uh, now I'm going to turn to uh, Michael. And Michael is a chemical engineer with a bio and with a biochemical engineering background. He wants to talk about uh, climate change. You know what the issues are, and he has some unique uh, solutions that uh, he's going to uh, tell us about. So, Michael, All right. the floor is yours. Let's let's kind of think about the entire Earth in the biosphere, right? That is the accumulation of biomes and ecosystems. It's all biological life is in this biosphere that kind of coats the Earth. There's many scientists, and I agree with them, that are starting to propose we're entering into historically a state shift. Biosphere right. and now it offers. This is a state shift. This is global. This has got to be in geological times and historic change that we're starting to enter. And it's being driven by climate change, which is underneath it is global warming and greenhouse gases changing the, the, the temperature, the atmosphere. What a lot of people, I think, kind of miss on climate change is it sounds like storms, but that's, that's only one part of climate change. The bigger underlying more sinister problems with climate change is think of precipitation patterns. We're going to have water falling in regions where it never fell before. We're going to have regions that used to get water through snow and stuff no longer get it. So regions that were water plentiful are going to become drought. Places that were fertile valleys or more desert oriented are now going to get floods. And if you really want to think about it, when our current you know, planet evolved with the stable climate system that we used to have. Where water fell, people grew to live and build civilizations. We, water formed rivers and lakes and natural places, and human civilizations evolved around it. When that changes, then the entire equation of where people live and how civilizations work changes. It's a whole new dynamic. And where the water now falls will not naturally be in natural catchment systems. So we're not going to be able to collect so one of the things that's really pressing about climate change is water. I want to just kind of bring this into it. Water, water, water. So I've been in the Natural Energy Institute, and I've been working in sort of the energy area for a long time. And in the beginning, when natural energy, renewable energy came in, it was all about let's replace fossil fuels, which are declining. Right? That was the big word. Peak oil. Peak oil and the cost and, and, and why it was isolated and so forth. I think we need to evolve where we think about energy derived from fossil fuels, whereas it's not just about resource. 
which is kind of why we fought World War II. But it's now about the use is actually polluting the world, right? So we used to worry about emissions from, bio, from chemical plants because of acid rain. We used to worry about flooding our rivers with raw sewage, and we fixed it. We have to think about energy use now is not just about having access to energy for air conditioning, for transportation, for food production, for food storage. We have to realize now that we're polluting the planet with it. And the level of pollution is, is if you want to believe the 15,364 scientists that just wrote a second warning to humanity, if you want to believe the United Nations report, if you want to believe the 13 federal United States agencies that all put out reports in 2018 that are giving extremely dire predictions, this is a global issue. And it is amounting to the CO2 emissions that comes from our use of fossil fuels. So, do you have a question? No, nope. we've got to cut for a break. Okay. One minute break, so <laughs> you've uh, elucidated the problem very well. All right. And uh, when Fair we come enough. back, let's talk a little bit more about the problem. But you have some really innovative ideas on how okay. we can solve this. So, we will be back in one minute's time. Aloha, I'm Jane Sugimura, host here at Think Tech Hawaii a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. So we're back from our break and we're here with uh, Michael Cooney from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, a chemical engineer and he's going to talk to more to us about uh, global warming and what we can do about it. So but before the break we're kind of talking about the problem and I hope I, I made a case that it's very severe and it is something that, that humanity has to take care of. So at h and &E, for a long time in my research originally, I was working from renewable fuels from the biomass uh, angle. And you can't help but realize there's limitations to how much energy you can get out of it. There's also limitations to how much energy we're going to get from solar and wind. There's just physical limitations. There's thermodynamics. So this idea that we're going to live as we do today with just bringing on renewables actually is not work. And we have the added problem that we actually have to begin by 2050, re removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So I've evolved into thinking about how to do this, how to bring in solutions that can work for society. Because in sustainability, which is something I teach a lot of, you have to get business involved, you've got to get culture involved, and you've got to get the science. They all don't agree. We end up in this wars that we've seen between the Obama and the Trump administration where, you know, they're using executive orders to do something, take it out, do something, take it out. So I've come across environmental management systems. This is what I came here to talk about. Environmental management systems is a set of guidelines put out by the International Standard of Organizations. And they also, they are a historical organization under Geneva that has come up with a lot of volunteer kind of procedures and guidelines for a lot of things, including food safety and this kind of thing. They've gotten very involved in the environmental issues. And they came up in, uh, with environmental management systems which was based on their guidelines for management. And the idea is companies and organizations can put into place an environmental management system, which is a set of rules, procedures, monitoring, how to do internal audits, how to give that information up to review board, to execute new changes every year, and you're trying to achieve some simple objective for the environment. But my idea is to have 
our state government, legislatures, and mayors and governors, everybody, get involved and start giving ta um, tax breaks or subsidies or whatever incentive you want to businesses to put in place environmental management systems, make it certified, with the goal of reducing their carbon dioxide emissions. The beauty to this approach is that environmental management systems are always tailored to whatever that particular organization, how they want to do it. They make it up themselves. Right. But some, it has to be certified. I would like it to be certified because that has all the parts in it that make it a certifiably good one. Right. It, and it, that includes auditing to actually show that you're achieving your metrics. All the state would have to do is just provide what they want the target to be and what they will give as an incentive. And then you allow the private sector to do the certification, and you allow companies to go out and decide for themselves how they want to reduce or how they want to contribute to the reduction of CO2 emissions. And as long as they put in a proper ma a management system that kind of follows the guidelines, and they get certified, they're good to go. And then it's a way to incentivize how people behave, rather than beating them with consequences, which they really don't like. We basically played a greed and help them become more competitive by achieving what we need, which is for them to reduce emissions and, of carbon dioxide. And, and the key is, while they're doing it, they're making money. They're improving their bottom line, absolutely. Right. Exactly. Without question, which you have, in, in the United States economy, in our capitalist society, you have to let businesses pursue making money. That's what they do. Right. And so let them go down that path by doing the right thing, which then helps everybody saves them money in the future because they're not going to lose business and disaster and all of the other sorts of consequences that come into the economy. So the scope is that pretty well everybody in this world has a job. So how does that the trickle down? So the business decides it wants to make money by you know, meeting this environmental management plan requirement. Yeah. And so point. then everybody's incentivized because A, the company's going to make more money because it's a profit. And if they're a good company, they'll have profit sharing in their company. So the employees get more money. So like they they get incentivized to do it. I used to do this in one of my companies I ran. I gave profit sharing every month. And you would not believe how incentivized those guys were all of a sudden to cut out waste and abuse and guys sitting on their rear ends not doing any work. Get to work. You know, this is profit sharing now. Yeah. So do you want to talk about that? So I really agree. I, I once had a wise boss tell me, that uh, this was at the university and it was a dean. And he said, um, took me aside and he said, and he laughed when he said it, but he said, I have absolute power. Now, it's an inside joke, is at the university, nobody really has power over anybody. But he said, I have absolute power because I can get all my faculty to do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. <laughs> and then he left, but it was a very subtle management technique because his trick was to get people to do what he wanted them, but he let them believe it's what they wanted to do. <laughs> If you try to get people to do what you want, whenever you want, you get natural resistance. So these environmental management systems through incentivization, you're getting people to want to do it. And I really believe people are generally concerned about climate change. They're, but they don't know how to get involved. So if companies and organizations at all levels, at all scales, kind of start to do one, they can be very simple, they can be very complex. You can start them out simple and you can improve them every year. It's an easy buy-in. Once people start to do just one thing, they like it. Once they get used to that one thing, they'll want to do a second thing. So the idea is to start slow, start soft, but keep the incentives to keep going. And then they'll become a critical mass where people start to realize it's a real problem, but they're actually doing something about it. They get excited about it. You get competitive. You know, then we're going to start having the, an Olympics on carbon reduction. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so... It's a way to get people to do what you want them to do whenever they want to do it because they believe they're doing what they want to do when they want to do it. Right. That's, that's what want, I think the trick They want to do it. Yes, okay. and that's, that's how we align. Okay. Thank you. Good stuff. My so, Jay, do you have any thoughts on that? Reminds me of Tom Sawyer in the picket fence, the white picket fence. Yeah. Do you remember how he did it? Right. He, right. Got, he got the other guy to yeah. paint the picket fence. Right. But, no, in terms of uh, you know, the practicality of this, uh, I mean, I, maybe I missed part of what you said, but doesn't, does the government have to do anything here? Does this all operate by itself? Because if the government has to do anything, I have great concerns. We haven't even gotten our act together on COP 21, 22, 23, and 24. Yeah. Um, so, we, you know, we're, we're really not committed uh, 
Um, don't, don't you think we should do that first? Do and, and as a national policy, you know, deal with uh, the uh, climate change, uh, you know, agreement and organization? Well, okay. So, um, first of all, what the government has to do is basically put in place the incentive tax breaks. They have to pass that legislation. And they have to set the objective, what they want, how much they want a company to be reduced. And that's it. After that, they're done. Is this the government uh, now or the government in 2020? Or yeah. possibly the government in 2024? So, in my opinion, and this is just coming for me, it is really time for everybody to stop thinking somebody else is going to do it. I believe the predictions that if we don't start removing CO2 by 2050, in this, my lifetime, in my child, children's lifetime, we will start to have die-offs of two to three to four billion people. I think we're hitting, we're going to go to, war is, war is actually common. I don't think there's any excuse for anybody anymore to say no. Everybody's got to do it at the state level, at the community level, at the national level. And if somebody doesn't start, no one else is going to start. So it's time to start finding ways to say yes rather than no, no matter who you are. And otherwise, this is going to get this problem is going to become an avalanche that we can't stop. It's that serious. It is you, very you imply rare. that You imply that things will happen to accelerate the process. You know, we, we see this as a, as a threat that might be a little bit distant. We can manage okay. And somewhere down the road where we have kicked the can, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have a reckoning with that. But I, would, I think what I hear you saying, and certainly what I believe, is that there are things we cannot exactly anticipate right now that would accelerate this to the point of you know, having it happen at a surprise time, a time that is much closer to the current time than we think. Right. Um, so I, mean, I think we could be in, in... On the other hand, one more point and I'll stop, and that is maybe we need to be refreshed. We need to raise our consciousness on this by having events like that. It, you know, we have all these weekly disturbances in weather and, and you know, just indicating, clearly indicating we're in the middle of climate change. And yet, you know, the government, and for that matter, business, well, should, the government and many people, media, for example, mm -hmm. they don't connect it. Oh, we're having a bad storm in whatever state it is. Nobody, nobody says, that's a climate change storm, man. Don't you understand? And it's going to happen again yeah, and again. Exactly. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I think it, we're going to need a shock therapy. That's my point. I think it's your point, too. Yeah, I think it's a good point uh, to wrap up. But I want to bring you back, Michael, because we're out of time right now. So thank you uh, very much. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks thank for coming for down me. and sharing your thoughts. And we'll develop those further, Peter. Thanks for that. Pleasure. For that. And hands across the table. Welcome okay. back, y'all. Yeah, y'all. So oh, that, uh, that's our show for uh, today, and we'll be back in one week's time in Hawaii, the state of clean energy and big ideas.